Hey everybody, Dana Shove, editor of Civil War Times Magazine. I'm back with Melissa Wynn, director of photography, and our good friend Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. We have moved a little bit west, a couple blocks, and we are in front of the All Saints Episcopal Church. And you can see the founding date on there, 1742. And as I said, Frederick has a deep colonial history as well. It's a really cool place. And it's a tourist destination. And one of the things I noticed earlier when we were talking, there's other people walking around, even now, taking photographs. It's a really cool uh, place to visit with great architecture that's been saved and preserved. And we're going to walk up the street at the end of this segment and show you a few other sites. We're on Court Street, uh, if you're wondering exactly where we are. And I wanted to mention, we do have some traffic going, some street boys, because just like uh, then, as now, It's a busy place, it's got a lot of traffic through it, so hopefully it won't cause too much of an issue for you. I want to show you, to start this segment out, a couple photographs that I have in my collection. We had mentioned the Confederates on Market Street, I think. Uh, the very famous photograph taken sort of almost an aerial view of these guys from a second floor window. If you're into living history at all, it's one of those photographs that you study endlessly to look at uniform details of Confederate soldiers because it's just hard to find out that stuff. But wherever, wherever you have soldiers, you're gonna have photographers during the Civil War. And there were a number of studios in town, including one by J.R. Market. This is his back mark, as you can see. Photographer working here. And this is one of the images that he took, a very nicely posed image of a Union soldier taken here in Frederick during the war at some point. Uh, so there's one image taken by him. You get that okay, mm -hmm, Melissa? Mm -hmm. But uh, here's a second one, a little different back mark. But what's really cool and uh, well pertains to us for our talk today, this is a hospital steward. This gentleman, the soldier, wearing a specialized uniform. He's a union hospital steward wearing a blue coat with a green armband with the medical staff on there that we are afraid to pronounce its name. because we say insignia. Insignia. <laughs> His kepi would have been made uh, with a green band around the base of it. And he also they were also issued a special cap badge, which you can see on the front of it. And he had a red stripe on his trousers. Distinctive uniform. Hospital stewards are very important. And what's really cool, and he's got a dog laying next to him, which I think is fantastic. I love dogs. Uh, this is really cool to me because this guy undoubtedly worked in one of these hospitals. He is a steward that undoubtedly, undoubtedly helped treat wounded soldiers here and at some point went and had his photograph taken. Hospital stewards are sort of like the backbone, would you say, of the, the, the sort of the meat and potatoes staff of the hospital in the Union Army. They uh, had the sort of the equivalent rank of a sergeant and similar pay as a sergeant. And Jake, if you want to take it away, tell us a little bit more about the steward's duty, because they're really important. Yeah, the, the surgeons and the nurses get all the glory, and the stewards rarely get that. Uh, and they, they are the, the, the backbone, the workhorses of Civil War medicine. Uh, stewards were responsible for all manner of uh, record keeping, uh, pharmacy duties. There are oftentimes pharmacists before the war, uh, especially in the volunteer units. Um, they're going to be mixing medications. Uh, they're going to be um, on the battlefield. Uh, many stewards will have roles within the ambulance corps uh, and in the medical evacuation and treatment on the battlefield at things like aid stations um, and in hospitals as well. A hospital like the one behind us, the old Episcopal Church, uh, would have had several stewards who would be there to assist the surgeons. Uh, again, with uh, mixing medications, looking in on patients, they would often have roles even during surgery as well uh, to assist the surgeons in, in any way that they could. Um, they don't get a lot of the glory, but the stewards are vital uh, to, to Civil War medical care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just think it's really cool. I'm really pleased to have that image. Kind of represents, that's a, such a neat image, and it shows the uniform really well. So, Jake, you want to talk to us about this church and it's actually sort of connected. If Melissa, if you could come in and tune up, you see another one of the spires here of another church, but it's all connected now. And Jake's going to explain uh, the role that these churches play. They were both hospitals. 
Yes, so uh, these are the Episcopal churches. Um, they are, uh, this one was the original. Uh, there was a church that goes back to the 1740s. Uh, but this one was constructed in the 18 teens. Uh, it's used by the uh, Episcopal uh, church community here in Frederick until 1855 when their new church opens. Um, this is one of the uh, many congregations in Frederick that was divided. Uh, by the conflict. And they have a, uh, a rector, uh, Charles Seymour, who serves with this church uh, in 1861 to the summer of 1862, uh, when he is a unionist, his congregation was largely southern meaning. Uh, that led to a lot of arguments and fights, and ultimately he resigned. Uh, and the church is without a leader until uh, 1863. Uh, but in September of 1862, uh, during the Antietam campaign, this is going to be among the many church buildings of Michigan. Many other buildings, more than two dozen, are going to serve as hospitals in Frederick in the aftermath of Antietam that becomes a hospital. Um, I want to focus on this one and, and decide to show you this hospital today and talk about this one uh, because uh, there is a great letter collection from the University of Iowa uh, that is digitized um, from the Bean family. Uh, that lived in Ohio at the time of the Civil War. Uh, one of the members of that family was Dr. A. A. Bean, uh, was a, a medical professional, and he's gonna come to Frederick after Antietam uh, and serve uh, in this hospital, uh, and he's going to write a series of letters to his family at home in Ohio describing uh, what it was like to be here at, in Frederick after uh, that, that terrible battle. Uh, and what happens here in Frederick, and I mentioned this a little in the last video, is that there is a surge of uh, medical personnel and supplies coming to Frederick after the Antietam campaign. It even begins before the fighting actually starts. And this is very similar. At the museum, we, we like to talk a lot about connecting the past and the present. Um, and we've been thinking a lot with the pandemic going on, um, just about how there are some parallels between the past and the present. And this situation in Frederick after Antietam is similar to what the situation was in New York City in, in March and April when there's so many people who are sick, so much help is needed that people come from all over the country to come in, doctors and medical professionals. The same thing happened in Frederick after Antietam. People came from all over the country, all over the North uh, specifically, uh, to come and help patients here in, uh, in Frederick. Uh, just because there were so many of them, 10,000 patients uh, that are going to be treated in and around Frederick after Antietam. So Dr. Bean arrives here a week after Antietam, uh, September 26th, 1862. He is given the northern half of this hospital as his, uh, as his ward. Um, so inside here was acting as a parish hall um, in the 1860s before it's used as a hospital. Dr. Bean has everything to the north side of the hospital. He calls this the old church hospital in his letters home. Uh, and he gives us an idea of what his day-to-day -day life was, it's like, like as a surgeon in this hospital. He wrote home in early October to his family and said, quote, am on duty from 7 or 8 a.m. Uh, until about 9 or 10 p.m., some part of the time until 2 a.m., but the severest time has passed until we get a new supply of patients. This is talking about more patients coming from the Antietam battlefield. He continues, times would be very easy now, uh, was it not for past exposure to the stench emanating from those who had received death, attended by profuse internal bleeding. The odor has made an impression upon my appetite. This is a trained military doctor. Um, acting in an acting uh, military uh, surgeon position at this time, uh, but had served with the Union Army before, so he has experience with some of this, uh, and some of the experiences, some of the senses that he is having in this hospital are, are pretty noteworthy to him. Um, in these letters, uh, which were written from September until January of 18, September 62 until January of 1863, he notes in the early letters that many of the patients who were severely wounded at Antietam are beginning to die uh, by mid-October, uh, those death wounds that he is talking about. Uh, but then it switches over to dealing with a lot more of the sickness. Uh, there is a typhoid fever outbreak in the Army of the Potomac in its camp west of here um, at Antigua, on the Antigua battlefield. But it's also going to get uh, spread through the, church, the hospitals in Middletown, Maryland, and here in Frederick. So he's dealing with disease. In fact, he ends up in charge of this entire hospital because all of the other medical personnel fall ill with typhoid fever. Um, and so he has to manage the, this entire hospital essentially by himself, uh, very exhausting work. But it wasn't only typhoid fever which was spread um, 
in contaminated water. Um, it is also going to be uh, smallpox, which makes an appearance in this hospital. Uh, and Dr. Bean talks about this. And I, I think this, I chose this particular story because I think it's really relevant to what we're experiencing today uh, with vaccination specifically. Uh, smallpox was the most feared disease during the Civil War. Uh, but it's one of the few diseases that doctors at the time had some ability to prevent. Uh, they understood and, and vaccination and inoculation was used going back to the Revolutionary War time period. And General Washington had, the, uh, had, had his army vaccinated um, against smallpox. Um, and so this is what Dr. Bean writes about the outbreak of smallpox he feared here in October 1862. He said, quote, we have one case of smallpox in the hospital to which I called today the attention of the surgeon who has superintendents of several hospitals. He said all the danger of infection had passed. There was not any place to remove him. And if people have done as they should, been vaccinated, all would be well. If they had not, they must suffer the consequences. This morning, Monday, uh, visited medical director and obtained an order for this patient's removal. It was done while I was upstairs in the gallery assisting the resection of an elbow joint. So there's still surgical surgery going on here at that same time. Uh, this morning has been spent in vaccinating have vaccinated 90 patients. Um, so he talks about these vaccines that are going on, and there is vaccination going on um, throughout the Civil War. Uh, it's one of the measures that they do have against the prevention, uh, for the prevention of smallpox. Um, Bean is gonna stay here on duty until January of 1863. Uh, and he's going to move briefly elsewhere in Frederick to a different hospital before heading back to Ohio. His uh, temporary uh, position uh, being fulfilled, um, his duties at an end. This hospital here closes up in January, on January 24th, 1863, um, and goes back to uh, being the parish hall after repairs are made um, to this. And also uh, the new church just around uh, was also used as a hospital as well. Um, as were many other buildings uh, that we uh, we might check out. Here right, we'll take a we'll take a walk up the street, take a look at those. Uh, that Jake's done a great job sort of personalizing one of these buildings with the account by a surgeon. Engelbrecht uh, brought this down October 20, 1862. So a month and a half after Atina, basically, the, and the South Mountain fighting, wounded soldiers is the heading of this entry. Our streets are full of wounded soldiers, many of them with one arm off. Yesterday I met two on the street. The one had his right arm off and the other had his left arm off. And another in the same company was wounded in the knee, walking with two crutches. If you would take a walk through town any handsome day, you might meet 80 to our 100 wounded soldiers. The majority were wounded at the Battle of the Antietam. The patients, as they improved, can be sent off to other hospitals. I suppose that we should have had altogether six to 8,000 wounded soldiers in our town in about 22 hospitals. He's not far off the mark. About nine to 10,000, yes, about 27,000 overall are, are used. And again, remember, this is a town of about 8,000. Put that pers in perspective to like a college, right? Like Kent State University, well, where I went to school, Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania, when I went there, it's about 5,000 students, okay? So this town at the time has a population of a good size. And to double it, not only quickly, but it's a super large. It's a real shocking idea to what these people are used to. The surgeon talks about the incredible steps you can't even keep. Another entry, which I didn't actually copy down, Engelbrecht was sort of moved by the fact that he met a 16-year-old drummer boy missing an arm on the street on one of his daily walks through town. So, speaking of walking, before we, we get off, let's walk up to the corner because there's some interesting architecture and some other churches up here we could take a look at. Now, I'll kind of drop behind. Uh, if you want to walk with uh, Melissa, and I'll grab your bags and stuff so you can tell what people are going to be seeing as you walk up the street. Yeah, so we're going to head north up, uh, up Court Street here. We're going to head towards uh, what is now City Hall, which was then Courthouse, uh, the Courthouse for Frederick County, uh, and what we call Courthouse Square. So we'll see, um, we're going to see some other uh, 
large buildings uh, with connections, some great connections to the Civil War, um, including, uh, look over here to the right, you see the, the building with the two uh, kind of uh, bell tower. Um, I don't know architecture, so I'm not sure what they, those exactly are called. Uh, but that is where uh, you know, sort of bell towers. Bell towers. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go with that. That's the was the German Reformed Church. I know, uh, Dana, you mentioned uh, you might be able to tell the the Stonewall Jackson story. I don't there. know the story. Uh, all that I know that uh, the story is that Stonewall Jackson, of course, a Confederate general, attended services there during the Maryland campaign and dozed off during the service. Uh, which is again, there's Civil War history all over the place, and actually. This is sort of the cool historic part of Frederick. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but if Melissa pans hard left, you see those row of townhouses? Those are considered like really great examples of federal architecture. Lafayette stayed in one of those houses during his tour of America in 1840s or something. Uh, 1820s. 20s, yep. excuse me, gave it a couple decades ahead. but. Uh, you can just get a sense, you know, we can walk across the street behind me, as I was joking, is the, <laughs> that's where I signed a closing uh, paperwork for our house, which plunged me deep into debt, so there's some <laughs> of my local, my personal history here in Frederick. And this is the 1862 on City Hall. This was actually built, constructed, worked on during the war. And you can see some of these great uh, row houses here. And some of the charm of Frederick that's still preserved and exists. Yeah, so coming out here, you know, this, this courthouse square uh, was crucial to, to Frederick's civic life. Um, this was the courthouse that is today, Frederick City Hall. Uh, but this was a meeting place. Uh, this is where speeches were given uh, before the Civil War, after the Civil War. This brick um, courthouse now, again, City Hall, um, though it says 18 up there that's when they they lay the foundation for it it's not going to be completed until uh, nearly the end of the civil war um, but this this area is you know, this is where a lot of the civic life of frederick is really centered and around it we start to see all uh, these other large buildings this is the new church that we were talking about we were uh, at the old Episcopal Church. This is the new one that they built in 1855 that is also going to serve as a hospital site um, where there is a, uh, just to the left over here, Melissa, uh, where there is the parking lot there um, over across the street was actually at the time of the Civil War, uh, one of Frederick's most renowned hotels and restaurants. Um, that was the location of the Dill House. Um, uh, if, for those of you who have been to Frederick, you. Uh, in the past, you may have visited Brewer's Alley, uh, which is over on Market Street, which actually has its own Civil War history. Uh, I like to call the Dill House the Brewer's Alley of the 1860s. It was a restaurant where everyone came, uh, many of the soldiers, wounded, uh, the medical professionals, uh, that's where they would have their meals. Unfortunately, uh, one of the, the buildings that has been lost to, uh, to history here in Frederick. Um, and then just over, um, kind of out of sight over here, um, there are more buildings on Second Street, churches, former school buildings that were used as hospitals, including a private home where General George Hartsup was being treated for a very serious hip wound um, that he received at, um, at Antietam. Uh, and he is going to be visited by President Abraham Lincoln here in October of 1862. So Abraham Lincoln passed through and around this square after his visit to uh, the Army of Potomac out at Antietam. And he gave a short speech at the railroad depot. Yes, yeah. uh, and he actually kind of gives a little, bit of a, a little bit of a prelude to it here where he says like, no, no, I'm not going to give you a speech, but you are good, loyal citizens yeah. of Maryland. Uh, and there are actually um, uh, patients from the uh, Presbyterian Church, uh, which is located just over on 2nd Street, uh, that were actually came out of the church to watch Lincoln and his small uh, coterie of, uh, of um, carriages as they moved on to the fence. Yeah, so there's uh, history, and like you saw the spire, uh, that line clustered spires, maybe we should talk about Barbara Fritchie briefly. Oh yeah. Because that line of clustered spires is in the John Greenleaf Whittier poem mm -hmm. about the clustered spires of Frederick's fame. Yep, I believe it's the, uh, what is it? Up through the fields, fresh with corn on a cool September morning or something. It's a fantastic, rousing poem. Whittier was an abolitionist. And based on the story that Barbara Fritchie 
uh, an old woman that lived across the street from Jacob Engeldrecht, by the way, with a Union flag as Stonewall Jackson's men passed through town. And Jake, could, I'm sure, knows more than I about it, but that's been pretty well debunked. Yes. And Engeldrecht debunked it uh, not long after the poem was published because he said, I lived across the street from that woman and I didn't see a, one glimpse of her in the days the Confederate Army was marching through town. She stayed well inside her house. So it, it you know, it became popularized. It's a great poem, though. Do you have anything you want to add about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll point, you, point you all in the direction of, uh, uh, of a local uh, historian here in Frederick named Chris Haw, who has done a lot of research. He's a local filmmaker as well. Currently works at Mount Olivet Cemetery here in Frederick. Um, and he has done some extensive research on the, the poem. Um, and there, though Barbara Fritchie never likely waved a flag, she was a woman in her 90s um, at the time, and she passes away a, a few months after this whole Antietam situation here in Frederick. Um, but uh, there is actually a school teacher uh, who was quite a bit younger, in her, uh, I believe, 30s or 40s, who lived uh, just a few blocks uh, further west on Patrick Street on the National Road, who did wave flags at passing Confederate Union flags at passing Confederate soldiers. So the story is not a complete fabrication, um, though the uh, poem itself, uh, Whittier had never been here to Frederick before. He kind of got a lead. Uh, this is from Cr uh, Chris Haw's research that he got a lead from a poet, uh, a woman who lived in Georgetown uh, down in DC, who had heard this story kind of third hand about a woman who, in Frederick who was waving this flag uh, and Barbara Fritchie was something of a local celebrity already um, with a dubious family history um, connected um, to, to Frederick's uh, Revolutionary War history um, so so it was you know kind of some propaganda mm -hmm. if you will to, to get uh, they make Barbara Fritchie's name more German um, in the poem than it actually was in practice um, Chris likes to say that uh, this is, uh, it could be that they were trying to get that German support of the war effort um, to, uh, to yeah. show that this good patriotic German-American woman um, mm -hmm. who uh, patriotically supported the, the, the Union. Of course, the whole story is pretty much fucked. Yeah, but uh, it's a great, it's great, and it's fun. You yeah, know? absolutely. It's a fun story as well. She is buried at, uh, in the city. Um, Barbara Critchie was a real person uh, at right. Mount Olive Cemetery. Yeah, she is, she was real, and she, she is buried here in so I think I'm going to kind of wrap it up for this spin right here. And we've got uh, at least one more location we're going to walk to and check out. Uh, anybody that wants to say hi or anything? Yeah, we've got lots of people on. Um, Mark Roller Steven, Marcella Roller Steven is on. Um, Billy Foster. Hey, how are you? Um, Mark Grimm is on. Hi, Mark. Uh, he's a Cleveland Browns fan. He's really he happy. did say go Buckeyes too. Oh, um, Buckeyes. Okay. David McCollum is on. Uh, Steve Gross. Hey guys. Uh, Drew Gruber and hey, Civil Drew. War Trails. Um, Joe Higginbotham. Hi Joe. Jeremy Brenneman. Troy Hi. Martin. Uh, Brent Boyd. Uh, William ba Williamsburg Battlefield Association. Hey guys. Oh, yeah, lots of people are on today. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad so many people are joining us today. So um, we're going to sign off now, and we'll be back pretty shortly. We don't have too far. We have a little walk ahead of us, but not much, nothing major. So uh, if you're interested, keep a close look uh, at your uh, computers. We should be back within a half hour, I would say, easily. So until then, stay the show. This is it. We're back to you now. Let's sign off. Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, Director of Interpretation. And we will be back with you later this afternoon. Thanks a lot.